Hello and welcome to the Church Society podcast. I'm Ros Clark, I'm the Associate Director of Church Society and today I am joined by Andrew Turner. Andrew, tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, I'm a vicar up in North Carlisle and I chair Church Society Council. Great, and I'm also joined by James Carey. James, who are you and what do you do? I'm James Carey. I'm actually a scriptwriter for the BBC mostly. It's my day job. I'm also a member of the General Synod. I represent the Diocese of Bath and Wells, uh, which is where I live. And um, from the General Synod, I've also ended up as a member of the Archbishop's Council, uh, but I suspect we'll get onto that later. Great. And certainly if you're watching in video, you may have been able to tell instantly which of the three of us work in television and radio uh, with, you know, the good lighting and the sharp focus and the clear sound. Anyway, it's nice to have a professional. And the edgy glasses and yeah. yeah. And the book in the background. Yeah, there exactly. It is. You know that jam. Yeah. 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 Uh, Amazing. Yeah. For those of, us for listen, for those of us listening in audio, uh, James has got a copy of The Sacred Art of, Art of Joking prominently displayed on his yeah. shelf, available Absolutely. from all good booksellers. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure. Great. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about some of the the sort of murky corners of the Church of England structures and hierarchy that you might not know about. Uh, we're going to be getting some recommendations uh, and we're going to start uh, by talking about one of my very favourite things of all time. Uh, that is sleep. Uh, I, I like sleeping. I do it most days and, and most nights. Uh, hopefully we all do. It's the thing I think I've seen a lot of people at the moment saying that with everything going on and all the disruptions to routine and the slight kind of constant low level anxiety that people are struggling uh, with sleep. So I thought it'd be good to, to talk about it. And Andrew, I know you've done some thinking and, and reading on this subject. Just what, what is sleep and why do we do it? Brilliant. So scientifically, uh, the simple answer to why do we need sleep is that scientists don't quite know. Uh, they kind of know it's important. They know a number of things that happen while we are asleep. For example, it's really good for our memories. It's when our, our memory banks sort of ink in uh, good memories from the day so that sleeping uh, really well helps revision, for example. Um, it's when your body heals muscles. There are lots of scientific things. Um, and we could talk about that. Uh, theologically, I, I think sleep is a basic reminder that we're not God. So that's the simplest way I could, I could think of putting it. So he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, uh, Psalm 121. Uh, but we are created beings, we're, we're made of dust, we're designed to be dependent uh, and not independent. So God has life in himself and Andrew Towner doesn't have life in himself. Uh, Andrew Towner's made of dust, my life is sustained by my loving Heavenly Father. And sleep is a daily reminder that I'm a human being, that I'm meant to be dependent on God. In other words, it's a part of the createdness of the human being and part of the designed weakness of a human being. We're designed weak because we're designed to lean on someone, and that someone is our Heavenly Father, our loving God in Trinity. That's, That's really, important. really helpful. I, as I was thinking about this, I was trying to work out the relationship between sleep, which is our, our daily rest, and Sabbath as weekly rest, or uh, seven yearly rest, or indeed eternal rest. How, is, is sleep just another form of Sabbath, do we think? I think Sabbath's active as well as restful, and I think rest in the Bible can be active. So think about the new creation when we'll be at rest, but we'll be building houses and living in them, we'll be tilling fields. Maybe I like gardening in the new creation. I think it's colossally unlikely, but it's possible because I will be transformed from one degree of glory into another. It's fine. So I'll rest. do your gardening and you can play my music and that'll be hmm. fine. Yeah, so, so rest isn't having a low pulse rate. Okay. Or isn't just having a low pulse rate. In other words, uh, on a day off, I'm going to get on my road bike and I'm going to get a really high pulse rate and I'm going to be doing so uh, in rest, if you like. Um, so Sabbath um, is more than the absence of your nine to five. In Exodus and Deuteronomy, Sabbath is really closely linked to salvation and being freed from slavery. And although it's a don't do certain things, it's also a don't do them so you can do other things. So it's really okay to have a high pulse rate on the Sabbath. Yeah, so maybe rather than suggesting sleep is a form of Sabbath, one of the things Sabbath does is similar to something that sleep does. So I was really struck by where you began with sort of sleep as an act of faith. 
because I do think that's what Sabbath rest is supposed to be is that act of faith that God will keep feeding us that God will keep providing for us and and God will keep sustaining the universe even if I am not doing it especially that Sabbath year that none of the Israelites were ever faithful enough to actually keep because it's terrifying to you know stop doing anything for a year and just trust that God will provide for you but I I wonder if we've slightly lost some of that sense of of the trust and dependence that we need to have in God when we lie down and go to sleep every night. I find night. it so helpful that verse the uh, God gives um Sorry, not God gives sleep to those he loves. That's, that's the hardest verse when you're sleeping. <laughs> oh, it's awful. You're just like, okay, I'm now also God doesn't love me. Great. Right. Yeah, well, I've struggled with that one. But the whole, um, he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor mm. sleeps is precisely why I can. So I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a Christian, and therefore I'm a church member. I serve that church by being a senior pastor. So I have to say, I can clock off because God doesn't. Mm. I had, had a mate years ago who'd been trained through some very, 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 um, impressive regiments of the British Army and um, had presumably been trained in sleep deprivation and I remember being on a, um, a, a crazy outdoor survival thing with him and he just had his first kid about six weeks ago and he said you know what I did when I had my first kid was I set my alarm for 30 minutes day and night and I would check that my child was breathing he said I've been trained by the British Army to to do to, to sleep deprivation all these sort of things he'd been one of the most famous and really really crazy the guys you want on your side regiments in the British Army and he said after 72 hours I've begun to realize that I couldn't keep my child alive I'm like mate I could have saved you 72 hours <laughs> and I think there's something of that in Psalm 121 isn't there yeah so he watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps so my heavenly father and their heavenly father isn't asleep so I can rest I can put my head on my pillow John um sorry I'm going to call you that but I'm going to try Please and remember, I'm going to try and remember to call you James because that's your actual name Yes. Um, uh, is it something that you've struggled with over the years? Uh, yes, um, only so in a way because I'm self-employed and I very rarely have to be anywhere at any given time. I could sleep to all hours. Uh, my sleep patterns changed when I got married. So before I got married, I would tend to go to bed at 1 a.m. and fall asleep listening to Five Live um, up all night with Rod Sharp. Um, and then I would wake up at about nine, uh, nine o'clock, ten o'clock, and that would just be the way I, I would operate. And so then my wife. Teenage bodies are designed, by the way. So, what you described yeah. now is precisely how 14 to 18 year old men's bodies are designed to optimal work. Yes. Uh, so, therefore, trying to educate, children, trying to educate yeah. teenagers early in the morning is a total waste of time. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so that, that was a bit of a shift. My. The thing I'm conscious of, particularly with, with regards to sleep and that I'm battling against is my besetting sin uh, is self-reliance. And if I have a problem, I think I can just get my head down and work through it. And the easiest thing to chuck away at that point is sleep. So if I've got a problem, I'll just stay up till 3 a.m. and fix it. Um, and I'll just do this, write that, uh, edit that, change that, do that, do that. Go to bed at three, get up at seven, do it again, keep doing, you know. So in a way uh learning for me learning to sleep is not so much about uh, what we've been hinting at about the when you're when you're asleep you're defenseless um so i think that is a really uh, helpful way of thinking and and uh, but for me when i'm asleep i am unproductive mm -hmm. and i i hate that uh and so i've had to work hard to sabbath uh so i try not to uh do anything particularly productive on on the sabbath in terms of regard to work um, but also I try to make sure I do go to sleep, uh, you know, at a reasonable hour. And if I have work to do to get up early and do it, that's, that's fine. But to sort of push on through, push on through is, is a, is a bad habit. And then that just sort of tips into something else, which I think is worth bearing in mind is how, uh, when people are tired, they make very poor decisions and they become quite grumpy and grouchy. And those things are sin. Uh, and therefore, I, I'm interested to, to, to see that actually, if we want to be fighting sin and to be disciplined, uh, then we do need sleep for that. So we need to depend on God for our sleep so that we can be uh, Christ-like. Uh, so for me, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of those things. But I, I, I'm not, 
you know, I, I like sleep and I, you know, but I, I, I my, in, my instinct is sleep is a bit of an indulgence and a bit of a waste of time. And I, yeah. I have to get over that. I definitely don't have to get over that. I, um, I really like sleep. And I would always have said I was not a morning person. I like a nice long lie-in and then a really slow, gradual start to the beginning of the day. And so, then an early night. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, and an afternoon nap. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I love an <laughs> afternoon nap. Um, when, I, when I was at Oak Hill, in our first year, we used to have Greek tests at eight o'clock on a Thursday morning. And then halfway through the year, they changed to, I can't remember, two o'clock in the afternoon or something. And my, my average mark went up noticeably between <laughs> those, those two halves of the year. And so, mine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Went down. But so I had a real revelation about this uh, a couple of years ago when I started doing... Um, low carb diet and genuinely I found I wasn't like I'd ever particularly struggled to sleep more but I found I would go to sleep much more quickly and I would wake up before my alarm clock went off. Wow. And not only that I'd wake up and not just think oh that's great now I can go back to sleep for another little nap and have a doze or whatever. I'd wake up and I'd be like oh well maybe I should just get up and do some things then and like yeah. be ready to go. So just the the kind of it's one of those things that was really obvious how we are whole people mm. because there's so much about our sort of physical way of life that's connected with sleep, but also our mental and emotional and spiritual state mm. is really bound up with sleep as well. Yeah. And I think sometimes we, we focus only on one or two of those things. We think I'm not sleeping because I'm really anxious or I'm you know, not sleeping enough because I'm this or that or the other. But actually we need to think about our whole being yeah um, and, and, how and that's why and that's why i kicked off with weakness actually because mm. um you need a really good answer at 3 30 in the morning to the question listen sleep's really good for me god um and i'm right here ready to sleep <laughs> and mm. you've chosen that i should be awake at three o'clock in the morning and i know that'll make me more grumpy i know that'll make my memory less good today i know that'll make my compassion less effective i recognize those sins that jan was talking mm. about and i love people and, and this is going to hurt mm. them and me. Yeah. So why am I awake? And, and that's why we, so weakness is the best way that I have through that. Other people might have better ways through that. Mm. But once I say that I'm designed to be weak in a whole bunch of different ways, and sleep is just one of them. Okay, so God could have made humans that needed 10 minutes sleep. He, mm. de he designed us to have eight hours sleep. God could have made humans with perfect memories, but he gave us imperfect memories and so on. Now, whether that's the, the fault of the fall or not, it seems to me in the new creation, we're still not going to be God. We're still going to be dependent beings. Mm. We're not going to be transformed into being Jesus, but we are going to be sinless. Mm. We're not going to have life in ourselves. We're still going to be dependent. So the best answer I've got for the, why am I awake at three o'clock in the morning is that I'm designed to be weak. I'm designed to lean on someone who's not weak. And my father needs me to be weak in all sorts of different ways for his glory to be shown because his power is made perfect in weakness. Mm. Otherwise I naturally champ at the bit of come on father, this is not useful. Yeah. So yeah. I wonder if yeah. way through that. That's all. I suspect uh, the, if you're awake at three in the morning, it's quite likely you're worried. Uh, worry, I think is worry and anxiety is quite a big, because also you then start to get worried that you're not going to sleep. Um, and you get into a bit of a downward cycle. But overall, I think there is one of the things that stops people from sleeping is worry. And it is interesting to me how many, I've been reading a lot of Psalms, like a lot of people, especially during lockdown, and watching a lot of people talk about Psalms. Matt, Matt Searles and Mike Kane are both doing some really helpful mm, Psalm unpacking. And boy, how many Psalms say, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. It might be the most common command in the Bible is don't worry because we are prone to worry and therefore we need to be told this endlessly. Absolutely. Um, and so, I'm always really struck as well. And you've already mentioned some of that, Andrew, but how often the Psalms actually talk about sleep. So one of my favorite is Psalm three. So David's there, you know, surrounded by his enemies, absolutely terrified. And in the middle of that Psalm, you know, he's, well, he's, you know, he's, he's got the enemies and then he says, well, you know, God's looking after me, God's looking after me. So what does he do? I lie down and sleep. And I wake again because the Lord sustains me. And 
you know, most of us aren't surrounded by actual warriors with, with swords and, and spears and, and so on coming to attack us. But, but whatever it is we are worried about, we can say, you know what, God is our shield. Oh, actually, it's all right. I can hmm. just lie down and sleep and the Lord will sustain me and it will be all right. Really interesting. Anyway, we need to move on. But um, yeah, if you are struggling with sleep, may, maybe try reading some Psalms uh, and uh, praying about that as well. Oh, there's, a, there's a book, isn't there? Um, is it by Matthew somebody? Matthew Side or something? Is oh, the one about it's sleep. Called? Matthew why Walker, sleep. Why We Sleep. There we go. Yes. We'll that. Do you want a really brief? So Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep, that's the high level academic one. Next Step Down, Rest in the sort of, the sort of light, lighter penguin ones. Mm. Uh, that's a broader thing. Even talks about Sabbath in there. If you want the simple one, this is the sleep doctor to Manchester United, Sky Cycling and stuff. Really good top tips about how to set up your um, bedroom. And then two Christian, uh, especially Christian ones. This is a fantastic book. And then so what is it? It's called Reset uh, by David Murray, living a grace-paced life in a burnout culture. Uh, read once a year, then read with a friend. I've given away so many copies of that. And then obviously Zeal Without Burnout by Christopher Ash. Absolutely not. And I think both Reset and Zero Without Burnout are just gorgeous books. So mm. helpful, really honest, really clear, pastoral. Yeah. Uh, highly recommended. Wonderful. Thank you. Good. Well, let's move on. And like I said, we're going to be talking about uh, some of those uh, corners of the church of England hierarchy that you might not know about. To be fair, I think most of us in the church of England don't really know anything about what it is as an organisation or how it works. I remember when I started working for Litchfield Diocese, the uh, diocesan secretary sat me down one day and said, Rose, Rose, do you know how the diocese works? And I'm like, no, I have no idea. So she's like, right, I'll, I'll draw you a diagram to explain. And, you know, by the time we were on sort of three sheets of A3, um, and, I, and the diocese said, so how, how does a decision get made? And she just looked at me and said, yeah. I mean, yeah. You spotted it, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it is a complicated organisation. Um, so James, you said a little bit at the beginning, you're on General Synod. You're also yep. on a committee called the Archbishop's Council. But, I mean, that sounds very important. It does. What, what is the Archbishop's Council and, and what does it do? I'm, I still don't really know, um, but uh, it's, it's one of those uh, institutes. It's, it's almost, like, um, almost like a board for the Church of England in some ways, B-O-A-R. D, not B O R E D. That's that's just a description of some of the meetings, um, but it is in a way kind of looking at fairly headliney stuff in a way that isn't. So you, you've sort of the, the the main power bases within the Church of England, I guess, are the General Synod, and also the House of Bishops uh, or the College of Bishops. I can't quite remember how it's how that's put, and then Archbishops Council. And there's an element of checks and balances. And they sort of share a certain amount of administrative staff as well. And um, so, yes, yeah, so in a way, no one of those three institutions can tell the other two what to do um, in the same way that those three institutions can get together and tell uh, a diocese what to do. And the diocese can take full consideration of those views and then completely ignore them in the same way that the, a bishop can tell a parish what to do. And the PCC is a separate legal entity and they can take full consideration of what the bishop tells them to do and decide to do it in their own way. I think they are slightly obliged to do what the I bishop tells depends, them to do. I think it depends quite what the bishop's telling them to do. Well, they, much, there you go. And so, yeah, so and I, I don't think anyone's been taken to consistory courts for disobeying bishops, uh, uh, particularly very often recently. But anyway, um, I don't even know if they still exist. Uh, but uh, they do, yeah, the yeah, they do. Yeah. But but you get the idea, and in a way, one can get all cross about that. But in another sense, you can say, well, this makes it a very resilient organisation because although it stops good ideas from spreading very quickly, it also stops bad ideas from uh, spreading very quickly. So therefore, there is lots of room for very good uh, evangelical uh, Anglican work to go on. And that for me is the main reason that I'm in General Synod is that I, my, I see it as, as my job to, uh, even though there are other forces at work within the Church of England, which I, I don't particularly uh, think are a very good idea, uh, I, I want to protect 
the uh, the really good work that is going on um, and work out ways in which it can also flourish uh, because uh, Orthodox evangelical ministry, I think, which which teaches the Bible is how the Church of England is going to grow and prosper and flourish. Um, yeah. And so that's that's why. And so. Uh, and so as a member of the General Synod, just to finish the explanation, the, the, the Archbishop's Council is a mixture of uh, elected and appointed representatives. And the elected ones are elected from, I think, uh, the General Synod. So as a member of the House of Laity in the General Synod, they have two members on the Archbishop's Council. There was a vacancy um, last year because um, uh, Canon uh, Mark Russell uh, had to step down because he took on another role, which meant that he he could not uh, continue in that way. So it came up, and I threw my hat into the ring, and uh, I got elected. Um, right. so, uh, so, so, so here I is, am. That is kind of my my next question, which you sort of begun to answer. That mm. if somebody's listening, and thinking, actually, I I think that is right. That would be great to have more evangelicals involved in in different sorts of ways, uh, enabling good ministry ministry to flourish, and and mm. so on. Um, probably you don't begin by throwing your hands in the ring for Archbishop's Council. Um, no. What, what, what might be some good starting points for people thinking about that? Well, I mean, in a way, I went from a bit of a standing start to General Synod. And there's no, in a way, there's nothing to stop you from doing that. Um, and so uh, that's worth considering. All elections pretty much have been postponed to 2021. So there's no need to rush out and do anything anytime soon. Um, but there was a vacancy and and i i sort of sensed that because i'm a i work for the bbc because i'm comparatively young compared to most other people standing um and i have two good looking daughters who i can have a photograph of me with on my election manifesto uh, or election address then i thought i actually stand quite a good chance of being elected and actually for, i got more votes than anybody else um, including other people who've been on general synod for 20 years but that's purely because the people who are voting for you are, are lay members of deanery synods. Yeah. And they're not aware of most of these church political issues that are going on. They're not terribly interested in much of the politics. And they just think, oh, they're young. Uh, I'll vote for them. <laughs> you know? It's really great, isn't it? The church room is definitely still a place where, certainly if you're in your 40s, mm. and I suspect possibly even if you're in your 50s, yeah you can still be in the young category absolutely and yes. i enjoy that very much but i yeah. think that is really yeah. worth thinking about when people are thinking about standing yeah. for election yeah so so in a way the general synod is is still up for grabs as it were and, the, and if that's of interest to you then talk to your, your your def your diocesan evangelical fellowship and they'll be able to um advise you further but on a very basic level it is worth just thinking can i serve on the pcc and can I be the PC's representative on the Deanery Synod? And so that is the, the local area that your parish is a member of a bunch of other parishes. And you look for ways in which you can cooperate and help each other. In my experience, the Deanery Synod is quite frustrating because it turns out that people involved in individual parishes aren't terribly interested in what's going on in other people's parishes. But that is not universally the case. Um, no, and I've been to a lot of deanery synod meetings uh, over the years in different deaneries, and and they do vary quite significantly. Yeah. Some are some are doing with some really great things, and, and others less. Yeah. So, um, Andrew, I just want to bring you in here as well. So we've heard um, from James a little bit about getting involved at parish level and at national level. I want to ask you about your involvement in the diocese. Um, so you're involved with the board of education, is that right? That's right. Yeah, I chair the board of education, the DBE for Carlisle Diocese. Um, why does the diocese have a board of education, and what does it do? I genuinely, when I started working for the diocese, I had no idea. I thought it must be about like Sunday school or whatever, but it's not, is it? Not at all. No. So, uh, public education was the idea of the Church of England. So, the Church of England was involved in free schools for all fifty years before the government caught up. We're delighted that the government caught up. But uh, sometimes the government seems to forget that it was actually us, not them. And some of the language that gets used is, um, is slightly ahistorical, I think. So about 300 years ago, the Church of England started developing these, these free public schools for all. And um, by public schools, I don't mean private public schools. I mean public public schools. And the um, government kicked in about 250 years ago, mainly through the work of some good old evangelical uh, campaigns. 
and uh, so I, I chair the Board of Education, which has some oversight of a third of the schools in Cumbria, as it happens. So different dioceses will have different uh, numbers of Church of England schools. We don't have any uh, formal engagement with uh, voluntary VA and VC, uh, voluntary, um, sorry, with community schools, but we have um, all sorts of different uh, engagement with uh, Church of England schools, secondary and primary. And uh, that doesn't mean that we take over from what the council do or what the government do, but it means we sit alongside that. So we have all sorts of influence. Uh, we have a role in appointing uh, heads, for example. We have a role in, in um, appointing um, uh, governors that are Christian, so foundation governors and training governors and training chairs of governors and training all sorts of people through the schools. So we have a huge amount of influence. So, for example, in the last nine, ten weeks, I've got a direct line to all the heads of the of the church schools in the county, a third of the head teachers in the county, a third of the chairs of governors in the county. That's massive. So we can engage with support and encouragement and pastoral care and all sorts of things, uh, which is marvellous. And it's one of those things that if we didn't have it, we'd want it. Mm. It's, I think it's extraordinary, the, the scale of the influence there. So particularly now that most schools are moving to academy rather than LEA uh, funding, I think that makes if you were to put all the dioceses together, so Church of England is the largest provider of education in, in the UK. It, it, it's, it's quite oh, it must, ordinary. It must, yeah. it must be in for ages, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I think the biggest, but it's, it's huge numbers that are uh, educated within the Church of England. And I think something like 70% of parents would like their children to be in a C of E school. So wow. it's not only the biggest one, but it's the most popular one by an absolute country mile. That's very mm. interesting. It's, it's clearly serving well beyond the, the scope of the people that we get in our Church of England churches um, on a Sunday, isn't it? What sort, of, what sort of opportunities have you had as a Christian? Uh, I mean, as a Christian, I hope everybody who's involved in the Rising Board of Education, but, but as an evangelical being involved in that, have there been issues that have come up where you've been able to offer, think about that in a particularly Christian kind of way? What sort of support you can offer? Or, uh, I mean, all the time. I mean, I all the time. When I took over, we were in need of a Darson vision for education. And there was a big national vision that had been worked up that was really outstanding. And then we had um, a chance just to ink that into our local context. So church schools are not about, um, some of their schools, they're not about proselytizing, but they are church schools. And we, we believe that life in all its fullness is offered through the Lord Jesus Christ and through him alone. We believe that uh, the Holy Spirit in a person makes a real difference to that person's life. We believe that, that grace and forgiveness and hope and all these things are found in the Lord Jesus Christ and are really good for human beings. Mm -hmm. And so we're unashamed of the, the goodness of the kingdom of God, uh, but we're not proselytizing. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of narrow thing there. So the, the language that Justin Welby came up with is that we're church schools for all, for Jesus' sake, which I think is really helpful language. So they are for yeah. all, um, but we are, we're doing it for Jesus' sake. So remember, think back years ago to all this push about not having Jesus in the workplace, you know, leave your religion at the door. And you want to sit down with your boss and say, now just, just to be clear, boss, the reason I don't gossip about you is because I'm a Christian. You want me to leave that at the door? The reason I forgive you um, is because I'm a Christian. You want me to leave that at the door? The reason I don't steal from you is because I'm a Christian. You want me to leave that at the door? We'll flip that around and say, we want all those things in school. We want the non-gossiping. We want the proactive forgiving. We recognize there's some real brilliance in uh, the kingdom of God. And we want schools that uh, embody that, that ethos. Yeah. And certainly a number of friends of mine have become Christians or have learned of Christianity primarily through uh, church in the schools. And recent history is brilliant on church in the schools, by the way, which it goes back to the middle of the Second World War. So in the middle of the Second World War, there's a whole chunk of theology being done around community. What country do we want to be at the end of the Second World War? And the two big theological pieces of work that were done were around schools and around the NHS. So it's really striking that these were uh, reset designs to bless the world. So they're for all, for Jesus' sake. And some of the writing there in the mid forties was utterly gorgeous. That's so helpful. I think um, so often the sort of uh, dialogue around uh, church schools and, and uh, Christian involvement in schools recently has been quite defensive and negative. People are very concerned, uh, for example, about some of the, the teaching around sexuality and gender that's going on in schools and, and rightly so, but it's really helpful to remember that in addition to wanting to be able to have an influence and, and, and so on around those topics, that we actually have a really positive vision to say, actually, we think that 
the Christian worldview around education is the best worldview around education. And therefore, it will not only be the best way of witnessing to, to Christ, but also will be the best for enabling those students to flourish in, in every aspect of their lives. If somebody is listening to this who's a teacher or perhaps a retired teacher or, um, I don't know, if somebody who doesn't have any involvement in education thinks, I'd really like to be involved in that, how would, how would they get involved? I guess the natural thing to do would be to find out what their parish's involvement with, with schools is. Um, I'm, I'm a governor at a local church school and at a local community school um, as part of being salt and light, serving your local community um, and just being known as a Christian, I guess, being a distinctive Christian difference. And, and it really varies. So some schools haven't got almost any community engagement through the church. So the simple thing to do there is bake some cupcakes, knock on the door whenever you're allowed to. You know, yeah. do Not right now, but yeah. Guys, thanks so much for what we're doing. It must be extraordinarily hard being a teacher. Um, here's 16 cupcakes. Um, can I bring you some more back next week? Or yeah. we'll to read uh, with some of the kids in school. Loads of kids don't get yeah. read at school. Do you know 9% of children in this country don't have a single book? That's frightening, isn't it? We had, I don't know if it's still active actually, but in Literal Diocese, we had a whole little scheme that was just called Pray, Bake, Read. And it was, what can you do for your local school? Pray for them bake something for them, offer to go in and read with the children. And so many churches adopted it as just a way of blessing their, their local church. Yes, to all of that. Mm. Can I just come back on your thing about the defensiveness as well? Because I think that's so helpful. And I think it links in with what you were talking to Jam about earlier. Um, and I'm going to show our, our communal ages here by quoting CJ Craig. Um, but okay. CJ Craig in the West Wing, rock the vote. Decisions are made by those who turn up. Yeah. So you want a better DBE in your diocese? Turn up. Yeah. You want a better Christian engagement in your school? Turn up. Yeah. And you want the Church of England to be more and more evangelical? Turn up. But I, I, I feel fairly passionately that if someone doesn't vote, they don't get to complain about our politicians. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think Absolutely. the same thing's true in the Church of England. Now, if you turn up and you prayerfully do your best and you get knocked back and you don't get any committees, then, then that's great. Use that time to do something else. But yeah. um, decisions are made by those who turn up, pray and turn up. Yes, yeah. I think that's then right. And so, Dives and Boards of Education um are uh, uh, people who are diocesan synod reps get to i think i think we had i'm on diocesan synod and we had a thing you know can you vote for your education people oh, or whatever yeah. i if, think there's a process isn't there there okay. is a different diocese so you've got unincorporated and incorporated boards of education okay. there's loads of ways of getting on so our board okay. is a third local head teachers a third local clergy and a third uh, community members um, but okay. some of those are put on by, mm -hmm. by Dustin Synod. So and find out, talk to your diocese, see what, see what the situation is, see how you can offer to help and get involved. Yeah. I, got I, would, involved. Uh, yeah. I got involved by turning up, by the way. So I got involved yeah. by being on Dyson Board of Finance and being one of the dozen people who had oversight of all our millions and millions of pounds in Cumbria. And it was through that that I got involved in um, the DBE. So it's kind yeah. of turning up that actually might open the door to more turning up, if you like. Great. Right. Briefly, James? I was going to say, uh, I don't know how many times Woody Allen's been quoted on this podcast, but he says exactly the same thing, which is 80% of success is showing up. Yeah, there you go. And so let's all show up a bit more. We've Great. succeeded in this podcast. Well done, us. Yeah. Um, good. Well, let's just move on. Uh, uh, every week I like to ask people for recommendations. Last week I didn't have any because I just run out. But this week I've got, I've got one or two for you. Um, related a little bit to what we were talking about earlier, I have been reading... The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Homer, which I'm not sure I would say is the best written book I've ever read, but I am enjoying the subject very much. And that idea, not so much of, of kind of building in the patterns of sleep that we're talking about, but you know, life doesn't have to be lived frenetically, and God is patient and love is patient. And those have been quite good reminders. I don't have a copy of Shade because I'm reading it on my Kindle like I always do. But I do have a copy of this to show you, which is uh, the new book coming from Church Society to all good bookshops. It won't be a bookshop um, very soon. It's going to be um, uh, available from Church Society directly uh, on Amazon as both digital and print on demand. So if you're overseas, for example, you'll be able to get hold of it relatively easily. It is uh, a series of guided reflections on the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer with also little introductory chapters on baptism, communion, and the church, and a short, short, uh, short catechism. So be ideal if you're preparing someone for confirmation or if you're getting confirmed. Uh, ideal if you're someone who's a newish Christian, 
um, but also uh, a great reminder for all of us. So there we go. That's my product placement. Uh, Andrew, tell us what you've got. Uh, I've brought this. Has this been reviewed recently? No, tell us about that. God in a Coronavirus World by John Lennox. I, I think he's written some fantastic um, apologetics books. Um, his one in the Oxford uh, apologetics books series, not this one, but the one in that same series um, is absolutely fantastic. In this, for example, 110 million types of virus of which 21 are harmful to humans. I didn't know that. Uh, we think virus is a dirty word, uh, but actually there's loads of them and they're necessary to life, um, he argues. In fact, uh, someone wrote uh, earlier this year to uh, say that viruses are the unsung heroes of our world. So uh, we couldn't live without them. Turns out we can't live without earthquakes either. Uh, didn't know that. So these things are necessary to life. And um, uh, really striking that um, to say that there are 110 million types of virus of which 21 are negative mm -hmm. to human life. And to say that humans will either kill or um, indirectly or indirectly more uh, people than COVID-19 this year um, breeds a very simple question, doesn't it? Yeah. If we think COVID-19 is evil for the number of people it's going to kill, and if we humans are going to kill more or cause to be killed more this year, why do we treat ourselves as good and COVID-19 as evil? On what yeah. basis? But it's a brilliant book. I mean, he's warm. He's very, very clear. He basically says, I want this book to feel like we're sitting down having a cuppa together and having a chat. And is this something, this is a book that you would uh, give to a non-Christian, perhaps? Yeah, I'm not would. I, I'm going to. Yeah, and it's perfect. really thin. It's thinner than my little finger. I mean, look at that. It's, it's yeah, people pages. always say that, like that's a good thing in a book. I, I like a big, fat, chunky book. But anyway. But, but John Mark Comey's book, even though it's really gorgeous, the 100-page version would be better. It's okay, a, I don't know how long it is. I, mine's on Kindle. I've no idea how long it is. If he wants to ruthlessly eliminate hurry, then he could shorten the book and give me more time back in my day, couldn't he? Yeah, there you go. James, what have you got? The 100-page the book that is a Christian book that I've most enjoyed in the last year uh, probably is uh, Impossible Commands by John T. Alcock. Uh, that's really, really good. Um, so that would be on my on my list if you've not read that that's well worth no I don't think I've even heard of it I don't know how I've managed to miss it what's so good about it is that he takes all of Jesus's commands where he so all the biblical commands which are Jesus telling you to do something you just think well obviously he doesn't mean that because that's impossible and going okay. no he does he, he does mean it um, and here's what to do with it so that's, and also John T writes in a really Great. really nice easy easy way I also recently read Gordy Knight by Dorothy L. Sayers. Oh, it's the oh, perfect book. It's like the best book in the world. On my list, on my list, it says... Really? Um, it says, Dorothy Sayers' Whimsy and Vain series for my oh, there we go. other recommendations. Yeah. So have you I've, never read it before? No, no, no. Oh. And I've, I've recently been getting into murder mystery um, oh. because of some stuff that I'm, I'm writing. But, um, but yeah, so there was that... There's, there's another book I've been reading, which has got a couple, it's got a brilliant title. The, the author's name is unpronounceable and it's called, uh, I don't know, the second one's called Don't Point That Thing at Me. No, the first one, this one's called Don't Point That Thing at Me. And the second book's called After You with the Gun or something it's like that. Genius. But it's a kind of um, take up of, uh, it's kind of Pink Panther-esque. Okay, yeah. It's, uh, I can't remember, it's, a, it's got an extraordinary name, but either way, it's slightly too much in love with itself, so I've not actually been enjoying it. But my other hot okay, tips well, would be, that, my other hot <laughs> tips though would be, uh, my wife persuaded me to watch a book she very much liked, which is Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day. Uh, yeah. And the movie of that I thought was absolutely terrific. And is the best two pound 50 or three quid you could spend on, on Amazon. Um, if you wanted, but the, on Amazon Prime is another lovely movie from New Zealand called Hunt for the Wilder People, uh, which is a movie that my sister who lives in New Zealand made me watch because this is a big deal in New Zealand and it was absolutely delightful. Um, right. I mean, it's, it's probably got some, some language in it and stuff like that, but uh, it was very, very watchable. It's got Sam Neill in it. Um, so Hunt for the Wilder People oh. is a nice movie, as well yeah. as well, Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day. I just got a year of free Amazon Prime, so maybe I will check that out. Thank you mm. very much, uh, both of you, for your recommendations and for your thoughts. I will be back again next week with Lee Gatiss on the podcast. Um, if you are listening to us on audio, you should be able to subscribe to the podcast via all good podcast providers. If you're watching us on YouTube, then don't forget to su subscribe to our channel and you might also want to click the notification bell so that you get told when there is a video to watch. Uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks so much for watching.